What is up guys? I do hope you are well. My name is Mark and today we're checking out some r slash malicious compliance. If you are new here, please consider hitting that like, that subscribe and maybe that notification bell too if you'd like more stories. And just a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for being involved today. And let's crack on with today's stories. Much love guys. This story is from 19notme73. Is this the hottest wing you have? I used to own a wing joint. Nothing fancy, but a good selection of wing flavors and beer. Sounds good to me. Inevitably, we'd have people come in and order the suicide wings. I like super spicy food, so these were pretty damn hot. Of those people, about 5-10% to would always start the joke slash sarcastic conversation. These aren't that hot. Can't you do better? Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> One of my best regulars, a dentist who fancied himself a gardener, decided to help us out and planted a ghost pepper bush. At the time, the hottest pepper in the world. And he could bring us the bounty of his harvest. And he would intentionally underwater the bush so the peppers would be as hot as they could be. When he would bring us the peppers, I would grind them, seeds and all, into a nice paste, which I would combine with our suicide sauce and keep to the side for when our spicy wing connoisseurs would show up and complain about the suicide sauce not being hot enough. I would only serve them one death head wing. Seemed a fitting name. I would make them wear gloves to eat it to prevent capsaicin burns on their skin. I would specifically tell them about the heat they were about to get into, trying to dissuade them from eating this culinary monstrosity. <laughs> but by the time we got through all this, every single person always now viewed this as an insult to their manhood. Never had a woman complain about the heat, but would sometimes actually ask if there was another level they could try and could be stopped from eating this wing. The fun thing about capsaicin oil is that it can often take a few seconds to kick usually just enough time for this person to scarf down the wing and start to smugly tell us how it wasn't that hot. And the heat would begin. And once it started, it was relentless. The wing was free, but the cup of milk after was $20. I never had a single person ask for a second one. Now, I'm a big fan of spicy stuff myself. I think the hottest I've ever gone was ghost chili and yeah, that, that burnt the hell out of me. I didn't hold back when I was asking for the milk and my eyes were streaming. And I remember sitting in this restaurant and it was like um, an, an American meats restaurant where they had like all barbecue wings and all that sort of stuff. And it was absolutely amazing. And I asked for these ghost chili wings and I remember this guy looking across at me when I ordered it and he was like grinning at me the whole time. And I remember just trying to hold it in for a while. My eyes just streaming and him just sort of I could see his shoulders going as he was chuckling, chuckling to himself about me. But yeah, I had to ask for the milk in the end. <laughs> but we'll start with Eric Wan on this one saying, when you need to tap out, don't let your pride get in the way. That's something I learned firsthand with one place's wings of death, probably Reaper, not going down that road again. And Kermageddon says, not exactly a wing story, but something that might fit in here. When I was in college, a friend of mine got a job working at a USDA farm where, among other things, they were growing some pretty hot peppers. One morning, he was tasked to pick some of the peppers. The person he worked warned him that once you start picking them, don't rub your nose and face until you washed your hands. He was careful not to rub his nose or face while he was picking the peppers. I bet you I know where this is going. At lunchtime, a truck came out to take him to a nearby office so he could eat lunch, but he'd been out in the hot sun picking peppers. He first went to the men's room to relieve himself of some of the water he'd been drinking all morning. No one told him he should wash his hands thoroughly before he urinated. He ends up having to explain to HR why the office receptionist heard him shrieking when he went into the men's room in a panic, thinking he'd hurt himself, his pants were down, and he had Mr. Happy in the sink, frantically trying to wash it off. I knew that one was coming. <laughs> And Coolest Mike says, I have a similar story. My family owned a restaurant and our wings were really a big deal. We made wing sauce differently than every other place. We had a mild and a hot sauce and that was it. The hot would probably be a medium at most places. So we'd crush up some red pepper flakes and coat the wings in them. And then put on the sauce for those who wanted it extra spicy. Well, in walked regular customer who always complains that the wings aren't spicy enough to the point he would tease my dad for the baby spice wings. Well, I had recently gotten a bottle of Mad Dog Pure capsaicin, I keep saying it wrong, to use for our chili just to add a little heat and not affect the flavor. This stuff only took a couple of drops to kick up the heat on a five gallon batch of chili. So the customer asks, are you gonna make the wings spicy this time? So my dad went all out with a crushed pepper sauce and put two drops of this, this Mad Dog on each wing. 
I'm pretty sure the wings took a bluish color until everything mixed together and sent them out. Now it's important to note that this was a to-go order. About 20 minutes later, I get a call and it sounds like someone is in serious pain asking for my dad. I put him on the phone and it turns out it was the customer. The wings were so spicy, he wanted to know what was in there and if we should call poison control or go to the hospital. We told him if he drinks some milk and has some ice cream, it should dissipate some, but he'd be feeling it for a bit. One good thing to come of this, he never asked for extra spicy wings again. Now, do you guys have your own spicy wing stories? I love to hear this sort of stuff because as I said, I'm a big fan of like spicy wings and spicy stuff in general. People ask me, they're like, oh, why do you like spicy stuff? And I can't explain it to be quite honest, but I really love it. <laughs> anyway, we move on to the next story. This next story is from Moon Silvery. Want me to F up some girl's life? Hell nah. Old story, but in 2007, I was involved in a traffic accident on the I-95 I-695 ramp in Baltimore. Traffic went from the speed limit 55 miles per hour to a dead stop around the curve of the exit in a space of 500 feet, and it just started raining. I and my Honda Accord managed to stop literal inches from the person in front of me's bumper. I had enough time to half a sigh of relief before I was rear-ended so hard that the can of tea in my waist-level console cup holder wound up splattered all over the windshield. I get out of the car and the person who hit me is literally crying blood. She's driving a Saturn that is at least a decade old and the ancient airbag broke her nose and black both her eyes. She's also crying for real because this is her only transportation. I go fuck grab an umbrella out of my now weirdly shaped back seat and hold it over her while she sobs, explain her brakes have been locking up lately and she was literally on her way to the mechanics and tries to text her boyfriend to pick her up. She's crying so hard that she drops her phone twice. And then a cop shows up. Baltimore cops are bastards, so he writes this girl a ticket about failure to control speed to avoid an accident and reckless endangerment and half a dozen other bullshit things to where the ticket would literally cost more than a new car and she might get her license revoked and or jail time. She's hysterical. I talk to her, reassure her it's not her fault and manage to swap insurance info. Fast forward two months, I had mild whiplash, but I'm healed up and mostly good regarding the accident have a new car and everything. I get a notice in the mail that I am requested to be a witness for this poor girl's trial for a ticket. Don't have to show, but it'd be nice. Fuck if I'm gonna let that cop roast her. I was asked too, I'm taking a day off work to show up. I turn up in court dressed in my civil servant's best, was working for the state government at the time. So have a stage you imagine, multiply it by three, and even toss on some makeup to impress the judge. I wait three hours for her hearing, because hell if I'm going to be accidentally late. The cop goes first, making up a bunch of bullshit how recklessly she was driving to have hit me in an accident. He's probably 10 miles away from witnessing from his response time. Then the judge calls me and I stand up. Cop looks this weird combo of surprise Pikachu.jpg and pissed, like he didn't expect me to show. Poor girl was already crying and starts crying more. So I get to the stand, get sworn in and tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So today we were going exactly the speed limit. I know because I checked my speedometer in surprise that there wasn't more traffic. That she was following a proper distance behind me because I checked my rear view mirror and she was a ways off. That it had just started raining after a dry week so the road was greasy as fuck and I knew that because I almost slid into the car in front of me, only saved by my car's ABS. That her wheels had locked up because I heard the screech and seen the skid marks and that she was definitely wasn't at fault because she was on her way to get her car's old ass ABS fixed and I mentioned that cop didn't show up until 20 minutes later. I know this sounds like an everyone clapped moment but the judge did thank me for doing my civic duty and turning up and I got a quick hug from the poor girl after the judge dismissed her charges. Anyway. Baltimore cops are bastards, and if you can turn up in court to fight a traffic ticket, even someone else's, you should do so. Now, although this is malicious compliance, obviously, I think you still can come at this one from two angles, right? Sure, this girl was having a hard time with her brakes and she would be going to the mechanic and what the policeman did in this situation may have been just piling on the fines unnecessarily rather than just looking at it as an accident. But at the same time, you could look at it from, you know, the girl took out the car knowing she had faulty brakes in, in bad weather and didn't keep a safe distance knowing her brakes were were faulty but at the same time it was a mistake as well 
obviously, because she ain't going to intentionally go into the back of someone. You know, you could come up from two angles with this one. I'm not defending anyone in this. I just like, I just like the stories. <laughs> But we'll read a couple of comments and then we'll move on to the next story. So we'll start with Poodle16 saying, Bless you for being a good human being. You're a rare bird. And Graphite T-shirt says, You sound like an awesome person. If I'm ever in Baltimore, I'd buy you a scone. <laughs> or scone, as some people like to call it. Let me know what you call it. And Shaytai says, I was a bit nervous at the part where you said she knew her brakes were faulty or were to that effect, but it's nice it turned out okay. And Connecty Katie says, I was lucky enough not to have many encounters with the police growing up, but when I was in my first crash, it became very clear to me that cops are not there to help. It was a stressful situation. My car was still obstructing traffic, and all he wanted me to do was admit that I was distracted somehow and at fault. If I had said maybe I looked at a billboard for a second, he would have written out as my fault and just gotten on with his day. And as Kyle says, I mean, she's still at fault, you know. Gotta maintain your car before it starts to fail. Greasy roads or not, you can't slam into the car in front of you. Kudos for standing up for her. More people should do the same. And Jeff Rawley says, Just came here to say that if you neglect the maintenance on your vehicle and it causes you to get into an accident, it is your fault. And then there is two sides to this. The more and more you go through it, some people saying, you know, it, it actually was her fault in the end. And other people saying, no, you should stuck up for her. It was an accident. Blah, blah, blah. Wow. And I, I'm almost going back to, is this person the arsehole? But again, I'm going on the wrong subreddit. I, don't, I do this every single time. <laughs> and we move on to the next story. And this next story is from Weasel Cannon. You want an omelette with nothing inside? Okay. So my first job was a server at a very popular 24-hour breakfast diner slash chain. We had lots of colorful customers. One morning, I'm serving a woman sitting by herself. I ask her what I can get her and she, and she says she'd like an omelet. We have a list of pre-built omelets or you can build your own. So I ask her how she'd like her omelet. Just a regular omelet, please, she tells me. Okay, so you don't want one of those signature omelets. What would you like inside of yours, I ask. Nothing, just a regular omelet, she replies with a huff. I pause for a second because this order does occur, but not often. Some people like their eggs scrambled and cooked, then rolled up. So you'd like an omelet with nothing inside? Yes, a plain omelette, she snaps. Now irritated that I've questioned her several times. So I enter the order, a five egg omelette with no fillings and no toppings. A few minutes later, it comes out and she is appalled. What is this? <laughs> Your plain omelette, I reply. But where is the cheese or the ham or the onions? She is irate. Mom, you ordered an omelette with nothing inside. She gets cocky and says, an omelette is eggs rolled up with ham, cheese and onions. Everything else is extra. You should know this, working at a breakfast place. I look at her deadpan and inform her, actually, mum, omelette is French for scrambled eggs that are fried and rolled or folded. Everything else is extra. I'm busy, so I walk off and help other colorful customers. Meanwhile, she flags down a manager to complain, who confirms that I told her and points out that in the menu there is, very specifically, a ham, cheese and onion omelette with a large picture in the middle of the page, then tells her she has to reorder her meal and wait a second time. She didn't leave a tip. <laughs> and in this one, I'm glad the manager didn't back down and go with that whole customer's always right bullshit all the time and, you know, just told her, no, you have to reorder that. <laughs> But there was one comment on here with a mini story, and you know I love a mini story. And Middle Name Danger says, I worked as a cook. One time an order came in for goat's cheese and sun-dried tomato frittata. No eggs, allergy. The chef told a food runner to get the waiter. The waiter came in and the chef told him we couldn't make the order. The waiter argued condescendingly that we could make it is simple. Just put everything else but the eggs in a pan and cook it. The chef was just shaking his head. The server added, do I need to go back there and make it? The chef explained it would be basically just some melted cheese with some herbs and veggies and he would not put that on a plate and send it out. The chef walked over to the front of house manager and told them to ask the customer to order something else. Something that made sense or at least confirmed that they really wanted a plate of melted goat's cheese with herbs and veggies for $25. The customer chose something else. The manager told the server they were expected to know the menu well enough to explain that type of issue to a customer before putting an order in like that. I would have called that guy out. I would have said, yeah, you can make that and take, send it out. <laughs> Imagine what that would have looked like, just a mess on a plate. But anyway, there isn't too many more comments apart from everyone just going, oh, that's awesome. So we'll move on to the next story. 
And this next story is from Smoke One. Sorry, boss, I can't come back in. I've been drinking. A few years ago, my wife worked as an EMS worker in our local township. She got home from work one night after a long day and posted a picture of herself holding an unopened beer and saying, I needed this. In the picture, you could tell the beer was still closed. A few minutes after she posted her picture, a major storm decided to suddenly roll through. My wife, being the good employee she was, called her supervisor and asked if he needed any help. He said, no, you can't come in. You posted a picture of yourself drinking alcohol. She objected that the can wasn't opened and every idiot could see that, but he wouldn't relent. But he said something about how it could be construed wrong. Fast forward a couple of weeks, it had been a stupidly busy day for her. And when she finally got home, she ran over to the shelf that we had a bottle of whiskey on, literally tossed me her phone and said, quick, take a picture of me drinking this. The cap was obviously still on, but she tipped it up like she was drinking it and posted it online as soon as I gave the phone back. Her boss called her 10 minutes later and said, we need you to come back in. We are short staffed tonight. She said, sorry, boss, I can't. I've been drinking. Check online. He tried to object that the cap was on and she said, last time I posted a picture like this, you wouldn't let me come in because it would set the wrong precedent. I wouldn't want to do that to you this time. <laughs> Edit. 50-ish percent of the people commenting are saying they do or have done the same thing. Mostly military, but one percentage of the people are commenting saying this is made up and never happened. It's quite amusing. Edit 2. For those saying the supervisor was correct on the closed beer, I agree, but you can't have it both ways. Absolutely. I know a friend who works call outs at the weekend and they do like maintenance on a building. So, so sometimes they have to go in and like fix the packing lines and stuff like that's going on in the building or air con or anything like that maintenance in the building if it gets requested. But they had this weird rule that they're allowed to drink on the weekends and if they drink, they don't have to go in, but they still get the paid the, the weekend fee. So it's very strange. It's like encouraging my friend to drink. <laughs> It makes no sense. So basically every weekend he has a, a bottle of beer just to start off. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it's a weird one. But we move on to another story. And this next story is from Pokey1984. My grandma complied with her husband's request for over 50 years, much to his chagrin. Something someone said to me today reminded me of this tale and I thought some of you would appreciate hearing it. So this is my grandmother's story. My family has been telling the tale for decades. Grandpa himself told it to his daughter's fiance as a lesson in not underestimating his new bride. Grandma told it slightly differently to my mum when she and my father were engaged. This is somewhere between the two versions. It's a lesson in be careful what you wish for as you might just get it. Personally, I've always thought that it was hilarious. My grandparents were very old school. Grandpa got a job for John Deere as a teen and worked his way up the ladder to foreman, then manager. Grandma was a typical housewife in the 1950s and was held to typical housewife standards. She was to cook, clean, and be prepared to entertain grandpa's business associates at a moment's notice. It was her job to make sure the children were taken care of and never got in her husband's way. She was expected to have dinner on the table at 5.30 sharp when he got home from work. Her house and herself were to be impeccably kept at all times, etc. They were progressive and well-off enough that grandma had her own car. She was expected to use it to run household errands and to take four kids to appointments and such. It was important that her husband not be bothered with such things. The household and family were her responsibility. He had a job. Well, one day, grandpa arrived home from work. And not only was the dinner not on the table, but grandma wasn't even there. The kids, teens at the time, hadn't been fed. The homework was still on the kitchen table. There were unwashed dishes in the sink and dozens of other little chores hadn't been done yet. Most importantly, grandpa was inconvenienced. He'd been home long enough to just let his frustration stew in anger when grandma's car pulled into the drive. He began shouting at her before she'd even had the chance to set down her purse or take off her jacket. He ranted about all the things she hadn't done because she was out running around when she should have been home, taking care of the house and making his dinner. He worked very hard all day to provide for this family. Was it too much to ask for a hot dinner when he got home? She had a very good reason for not being home, but he never let her tell it, except in no excuses. But she was a good wife, so she intended to let him vent for a while. Then she would serve him supper and explain what had gone wrong. Then grandpa screwed up. As sometimes happens when we speak in anger, he began to blame the wrong thing for his irritation. He began to blame the car and her access to it. 
He said something to the effect of, you didn't have any business out driving around anyway. You should be home. I should never have let you start driving in the first place. Women shouldn't drive. You don't want me to drive, Grandma asked calmly, retrieving her keys from her purse. Fine, then I won't drive ever again. And she set those keys on the counter, put her things away and served dinner. And bless her heart, Grandma stuck with that declaration, no matter how much more difficult it made life. Grandma had to take afternoons off in the middle of the week when a teacher scheduled a meeting. He didn't get a moment's peace on the weekends, between grocery trips and taking the kids to activities or doctor's appointments or for haircuts or clothes. He had to drive Grandma to every Saturday salon appointment. Previously, Grandma had taken herself and the kids to church, letting them sleep. Now he had to wake up early on Sundays to take them all himself. Grandpa was nearly as stubborn as his wife. He held out, expecting her to apologize and ask for her keys back. She never did. Instead, she simply rearranged the household schedule so that he could handle all the driving. Months later, after never getting a single weekend to relax, after having dinner pushed back nearly every day because he had to drive someone someplace, he finally gave in and apologized. He tried to tell her that he was wrong and that she should start driving again. He tried to tell her that he now appreciated all he did to make his life easier. He all but begged to take those keys. I suspect that grandma had always disliked driving because she never did take back those keys. Nothing grandpa said or did could convince her to get back behind the wheel. He said she had no business driving a car and she was gonna hold him to that declaration no matter what. For over 50 years until the day she died, grandma never drove a car again for any reason. Not after the kids graduated and moved out. Not after grandpa retired. Even after grandpa's death in the 80s, she still refused because my husband always said that women shouldn't drive. And there was an ETA on this one said, a lot of people are asking and some seem very confused. I haven't even managed to read all the comments yet and I'm really glad so many liked the story. So I'm copying the answer I gave of one of the comments here. As to the reason for the whole argument and why grandma was late that day. Sadly, as with the start of most epic arguments between married persons, the details of the, the triggering cause have been lost to time. Grandma telling the story 40 years later recalled that it had been one of those days for her. She'd been making dinner and, had, and it was nearly ready when she discovered that she'd forgotten to buy something that seemed vital at the time. So she stepped out to fetch it. And one thing led to another until a 10 minute trip turned into nearly two hours accounting for car trouble. The only part of said trouble that she recalled clearly was a flat tire and only because grandpa had to take the car to the shop to have the tire repaired later that week. And he grumbled about how it was just another example of why women shouldn't be driving. And then says, I'd also remind people that this was a completely different era. The argument was 70 years ago now. My grandparents were children of the Great Depression. This comment, the comment which says, haha, I love the story, but it's honestly a testament to how much they cared for each other. Your grandpa might have grumbled, but he still did it. Even took your grandma to do frivolous things like hair appointments. And your grandma was an amazing woman. She could have easily argued and made her points, but she was playing 10 moves ahead in chess while your grandpa was still thinking they were playing checkers. She handled it with love, really. I'm sorry for your loss. I know things were different back then, but it seems to me that they were kind people you could learn a lot from. And continues to say was actually very accurate. Watch some television from the 40s and 50s and you'll get a better understanding of the dynamic. My grandparents loved each other dearly for their entire lives. Piecing things together long after the fact, the entire family is, is pretty sure grandma never liked to drive. She was even less than five feet tall, a tiny woman to be sure. Don't forget how cars were built in the 40s and 50s. Grandpa had initially pushed her to get a license and bought her a car. Many women of that era never drove or only learned to drive very late in life when cars got easier to handle. That being said, I do agree that this is hardly the healthiest way to end an argument. However, that was never the intent of the story. 50 years of malicious compliance from grandma. We, she knows how to handle him. <laughs> now, what do you guys make of today's collections of stories? Did you enjoy them? Let me know in the comments below if you did, because I love a bit of malicious compliance. And you know, if you guys are liking it and making comments on it, then it encourages me to do more, basically. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. And if you'd like to support the channel further, you absolutely can by clicking that join button down below for YouTube or clicking the link in the description for Patreon and joining up there. Thank you so much for your love, your time and your support. And I will see you, I hope so anyway, in the next one. Take care, guys. Much love.